Good afternoon. I would first like to thank uh, Kaumadi and uh, the entire team of organizers for inviting me to make a presentation at this symposium and uh, putting up with uh, various inconveniences and uh, several of my in, uh, idiosyncrasies. I am extremely sorry that I could not uh, come to Kanpur in person for the presentation and um, I also apologize for any inadequacies of this uh, video presentation. Okay, what I am going to talk about today is uh, the Anicuts of South India. Uh, this is a work that we um, took, took up about a little more than 10 years ago. Chitra Krishnan was doing her PhD and what I am going to do, be describing today is mainly her uh, PhD work. Okay. And um, um, as uh, will become aware in the talk, um, the, uh, it is effectively a civil engineering uh, problem and um, uh, my background is mechanical engineering. So, most of the inputs to the uh, research methodology and uh, the way uh, the project was conducted uh, came from uh, Chitra who is a civil engineer. So, I am the uncivil partner in this uh, project. Okay. The project was funded by uh, INSA. Now, um, the motivation goes back, uh, motivation for studying this problem goes back uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, when I just started uh, my career as a, a faculty member at IIT, uh, then Narbada Bachao Andolan was very much in the news. And um, <coughs> there was several questions that arose uh, based on their criticism of the uh, <coughs> Narbada Dam. Uh, I mean, the, the Andolan obviously pointed out to uh, several of uh, problems and uh, inadequacies of the design and the implementation of the uh, uh, dam, uh, <coughs> uh, flooding of large tracts of land, and then uh, displacement of people, and so on. Now, the questions that uh, arose uh, from that is um, were these uh, problems uh, real or imagined? Was it just hype being created by an uh, activist group? Um, and then are these problems of engineering or uh, something beyond engineering? And uh, finally, uh, the, is it just a case of um, bad implementation that uh, uh, it is poor um, implementation of a uh, reasonably good design method or is it uh, bad design or bad science? And um, having studied the uh, <coughs> problem over uh, two or three years, um, it became clear that yes, the problems are uh, were very real and are very real. Uh, it is a problem of engineering, but uh, because ultimately the whatever the sociological problems, the starting point is the uh, engineering product, which is the dam. And uh, <coughs> when one dug a little further, uh, one realized that it's not really a case of uh, bad implementation. The um, <coughs> design and the design method itself had uh, several uh, shortcomings. And uh, when we explored uh, uh, this a little further and looked at other uh, uh, large engineering uh, <coughs> systems or solutions, find that with every uh, engineering advance, there is a price that one has to pay. And uh, in, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, of, co of course, there have been several uh, uh, discussions and um, <coughs> uh, 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 the awareness, awareness of the uh, side effects of uh, engineering are uh, apparent to everyone. I mean, I have just listed a, a few of the uh, many uh, problems created by uh, the uh, industrial advance of the last 100 years. Um, a sizable deforestation, uh, and air and water pollution, uh, lowering of the water table over uh, much of the globe, and of course, uh, global warming and so on. Now, the question is, um, <coughs> what is the uh, uh, role of academic institutions in uh, <coughs> handling these problems or in uh, trying to fix how we do science to respond to uh, this. Now, <coughs> the main, um, the, um, the basic uh, uh, shortcoming can be traced to the very method that uh, we employ. The modern scientific method uh, as a starting point uh, separates facts from value and science being a study of facts is necessarily separated from ethics. And uh, <coughs> uh, therefore, while we can build very efficient and um, 
uh, startlingly uh, remarkable systems in a laboratory, once they are taken into the uh, field, uh, the way the environment interacts with them or the or society interacts with them is something that is very um, uh, difficult to predict or uh, model or uh, <coughs> handle. Okay. The, uh, the other uh, problem is what science can answer very easily is uh, the question like can something be done, can we make a car that can accelerate from uh, uh, 0 to 60 kilometers an hour in 5 seconds or 10 seconds, uh, can we send a, a probe to the moon and Mars. <coughs> but uh, ought or should it be done is uh, out of the realm of science, it is something that uh, has to be brought in by the human being, it is, uh, it is in the uh, <coughs> realm of ethics and uh, philosophy and not science. Now the and uh, necessarily then with this uh, dichotomy or this uh, separation of uh, fact from value and science from ethics, um, we would expect that unless uh, we are extremely fortunate or extremely careful, uh, any uh, scientific or technological advance could be a potential uh, <coughs> uh, danger or uh, could lead to uh, potential problems. Because uh, this is uh, this analysis of the scientific method. Uh, I am grateful for uh, discussions with uh, two philosophers and a sociologist uh, who are listed here, uh, Professor K. J. Shah, Anuradha, uh, Dr. Anuradha Shah and uh, Professor J. P. S. Uberoy. Okay. <coughs> now, um, on the other hand, the, the what little exposure we had uh, to traditional systems uh, led us to believe that uh, the way the problem is posed and it is handled in the traditional framework is um, very different. It appears that uh, the preservation of the environment or the uh, uh, sustainability is a core um, <coughs> or uh, uh, a basic uh, starting point in all their analysis and uh, design. Okay. So, our uh, long term objective in uh, taking up uh, any of our projects, there were uh, three or four uh, traditional systems that uh, uh, over the last 20 years we have looked at, <coughs> was to try and rediscover the science and engineering and the design method of traditional systems, so that they may be put to use in addressing uh, present day engineering problems. And uh, en route to this long term objective, which is still uh, um, pretty open um, after uh, nearly 15 years of uh, work in this uh, 15 years of work in this area. Um, <coughs> short term ob objective was to understand the working of uh, uh, some examples of traditional engineering to try and get a handle on the uh, design method. Now, of course, uh, there are there could have been other approaches to studying traditional systems. One could have uh, uh, looked at um, uh, traditional texts on engineering or architecture or irrigation and uh, some of them are available and some of them are available in translation. <coughs> However, the um, uh, problem there is that uh, one the uh, <coughs> translations uh, that are available are few, uh, especially in English uh, and uh, it is usually the translations undertaken by someone who does not necessarily have uh, an engineering background. So, it is very uh, uh, unlikely that one would get a, uh, a precise uh, description that would enable us to deduce uh, uh, underlying principles. So, we felt that the um <coughs> simpler route would be to take examples of traditional engineering and then uh, study them in detail. Okay. So, <coughs> The uh, specific problem that I am going to look at uh, today is that of the Grand Anicut, uh, which is a side weir and uh, <coughs> a comparison of modern uh, weirs with uh, traditional uh, <coughs> designs or, or anicuts. Okay. A weir is uh, an obstruction placed in a river that uh, helps to divert the flow. Okay. It could be, it is uh, effectively like a submerged dam. Uh, before getting on to the specific problem, we just just to give you an overview of the extent of the uh, <coughs> irrigation systems in South India, um, there are nearly 3 lakh tanks irrigating nearly 40 lakh hectares. The uh, systems are of uh, different sizes 
uh, the uh, <coughs> bund height could be as high as uh, 30 meters, the tank circumference could be as large as 64 kilometers and the capacity uh, could be as much as 75 million meter cube. So, these are not small systems uh, by any means. Okay. Now, the specific uh, problem that as I said we want to look at is the uh, <coughs> uh, Grand Adicut which is uh, on the Kaveri river. It, uh, uh, the map here shows the full extent of the Kaveri river, it starts in Karnataka and a part of it uh, comes from Kerala also and but most of it uh, flows in uh, Tamil Nadu. Okay. <coughs> Uh, the the uh, recent uh, dam that was built on one of the uh, tributaries, uh, <coughs> the Metur Dam is shown here and the region that we are interested in is uh, uh, near uh, the island of Srirangam which is close to the delta of the Kaveri river. The total extent from here to here would be around uh, 8, uh, 750 or uh, 760 kilometers. Okay. Now, in 1800 as per the uh, records available, uh, the uh, about 6 lakh acres were irrigated uh, in this in the Kaveri delta and um, <coughs> uh, it, the functioning of the Grand Anicut was crucial uh, to cultivation in this uh, area. Now, there is a here is a more detailed view of the same thing and now we are focusing on the island of Srirangam. As you can see that uh, the at the start the <coughs> or upstream of the island of Srirangam you have the undivided uh, Kaveri or the Akhand Kaveri and it splits into two parts. The lower branch uh, which is slower and uh, less steep and which is what uh, has an extensive delta and uh, is used for irrigation retains the name Kaveri while the upper branch is faster and steeper and it is called uh, Kolidam or uh, Kolaroon. The anglicized name is Kolaroon. Okay. And uh, <coughs> um, the bifurcation that started at the uh, upstream end of the island of uh, Srirangam uh, <coughs> uh, ends at the downstream end and the, the remerger of the Kaveri and the Kolarun is prevented by the uh, Grand Anicut. Okay. Uh, the two rivers come very close to each other here, but there is a, a difference in slope because this is a much uh, the uh, Kolidam is a much steeper river. Okay. If I look at uh, <coughs> even uh, more detailed picture, this is the Kaveri and I think this is the deep river channel that is shown there and there is a small connecting stream called the Ular and the Kalanai or the Grand Anicut is uh, across the Ular. Okay. It prevents the flow uh, when the levels are low, it prevents the flow of the Kaveri into the uh, <coughs> Kolidam, but uh, during flood it allows the waters to pass. Okay. Now, there were two uh, functions that the Grand Anicut was supposed to perform and one was to prevent the Kaveri from uh, flowing into the Kolidam and uh, allowing the waters to come to the irrigated areas uh, in the south. Uh, <coughs> the, um, the other function was during floods, it had to allow uh, the flood waters to uh, pass safely over it into the Kolidam and uh, down to the sea, thereby protecting the irrigated lands and also allow uh, silt to pass over easily, uh, so that uh, silt that did not accumulate in the slower uh, Kaveri branch. Okay. So, um, the uh, Grand Anicut is uh, supposed to have been built around uh, the second century AD, so it is nearly uh, 2000 years, it is about 1800 years old now. And, uh, from whatever records are available, the uh, for the si first 1600 uh, years of its life, uh, it performed its function uh, without any problem. It uh, <coughs> provided uh, uh, water for irrigation in this area and then prevented uh, excessive flooding during uh, storms. Uh, here is a detailed view of the uh <coughs> structure of the Grand Anicut itself. Um, as you will see later on, the present structure is very, very different from this. We wanted to look at how uh, the Grand Anicut or the side weir could function in its original form. So, we uh, uh, Chitra dug up uh, records, uh, this is taken from a 1777 British record of the uh, <coughs> Grand Anicut and you can see that it is nearly uh, the scale is distorted. So, the um <coughs> some uh, it's, it uh, some lengths are uh, magnified much more than others. Uh, but the overall length is about 340 meters 
<coughs> the average height is about uh, 7 feet 2 inches which is a little more than 2 meters. And then uh, from the upstream to the downstream end uh, view from along the Kaveri, there is a drop of about uh, uh, 1 feet 4 inches or 16 inches. <coughs> if you look at the um, uh, sectional view, uh, you can see that the bed level on the Kaveri side and the uh, Ular side is uh, slightly different and it would further decrease when the Ular meets the uh, Collidum. Uh, uh, the top of the uh, Anicut is not flat, but there is a sl slope from the Kaveri side to the Ular side and uh, <coughs> the, there is a difference in height of about 3 and a half feet over a total width of about 70 feet. As I said the drawing is not to scale, this width is 70 and uh, this height is about uh, 3 and a half feet. Okay. Okay. Now, <coughs> when the uh, British uh, took over uh, uh, the region in around uh, 1801, um <coughs> there were several problems already faced by uh, uh, the people of uh, uh, Tanjavur uh, district, uh, because uh, due to the political upheavals in the uh, preceding uh, 20, 25 years, the uh, Anicut was in very bad uh, disrepair, the regular maintenance that was required was not done. So, most of the uh, protecting uh, plaster on the uh, Anicut itself was uh, destroyed and um, <coughs> the people were facing a lot of problem because the uh, flows in uh, the Kaveri were uh, reducing year by year. Okay, so, the amount of water available for irrigation uh, uh, kept reducing. Now, <coughs> to understand why the um, uh, Kaveri uh, should uh, have faced reduced flows, now one can look at what happens when you have a bifurcation uh, and an unequal bifurcation. If you have a river flowing, <coughs> then for a given um, uh, geometry and flow velocity, there is a certain sediment load that the river can uh, uh, sustainably uh, carry. If the sediment load is higher, uh, then it would tend to deposit it, if it is lower, it would tend to erode. Uh, so, that is one uh, thing to look at. The other thing is when you have a bifurcation and an unequal bifurcation, then the uh, sediment uh, distribution is not uh, <coughs> is does not follow the uh, same uh, ratio as the flow would. In fact, the um, slower or the lower uh, flow rate branch carries more than its uh, proportional load of silt. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, these measurements are very uh, difficult to uh, actually make, but whatever uh, data is available, uh, there is a uh, paper published by Wang and others in 1995. And <coughs> what is shown here is uh, given flow rates Q1 and Q2 between the two branches and silt loads S1 and S2. Then uh, when Q1 is bigger than Q2 by a factor of 2, S2 is bigger than S1 by a factor of 1.6. Okay. So, Q1 is bigger than Q2, but S2 is bigger than S1. So, the uh, slower branch carries much more, uh, although it carries only 30 percent of the uh, uh, total uh, water flow, it carries nearly 60 percent of the silt load. Okay. Now, that is what is uh, happening at this uh, point between the Collidum and the Kaveri. The Collidum uh, uh, being much faster carried more of the uh, water, but most of the silt came into the Kaveri. Now, it appeared that the function of the uh, Grand Anicut was not only to prevent the uh, <coughs> flow of the water from the Kaveri to the Collidum during uh, the uh, low flow uh, times, but during floods it was allowed the water to pass at the same time allowed the silt that had accumulated here uh, to pass into the Collidum, so that uh, an equilibrium was maintained uh, between the two branches. And this was what was, uh, uh, this equilibrium was what was destroyed when the <coughs> uh, maintenance was not carried out properly. Okay, so, the uh, British then uh, started uh, modifying the structure to take care of the problem and uh, it appears they did not really understand the uh, <coughs> uh, working of the uh, uh, Grand Anicut or the uh, <coughs> environment very well. The first thing they did was to, uh, to uh, allow greater flow to be retained on the Kaveri branch. Uh, they raised the height of the uh, Grand Anicut by uh, two and a half feet and they flattened the top. 
Now, the original uh, design uh, as we saw has a, a slight slope and there were other places where there are a few notches in the uh, top which are not shown in this figure, but there are uh, places where the upper surface is notched. All that was removed, the top was flattened and the uh, slope of uh, this drop of uh, uh, nearly one and a half feet from the upstream to downstream also was removed and it was made perfectly flat. Okay. Now, <coughs> Uh, although initially the uh, because of the increased height uh, the uh, flow rates improved over time the uh, silting problem continued and uh, <coughs> by 1830 after about 25 years they found that the, the problem uh, uh, did not go away the cavery was uh, continuously uh, uh <coughs> uh, getting lesser and less of the uh, flow of the river so at that point in uh, 1830 under sluices were dug under the uh, Grand Anica to allow sediment to um, uh, cross over and keep this area free. So, to allow uh, greater bed slope in the Kaveri and uh, greater flow. Um, when this did not work, there were further under sluices dug in the uh, Kaveri uh, downstream of the Anica to again uh, increase the bed, bed slope here. Finally, uh, a dam was con constructed here. Uh, or an anicut was uh, constructed here uh, at at the st uh, start of the col uh, collidum branch. This reduced the flow in the collidum and obviously increased the flow into the Kaveri. Okay. Uh, but then by 1845 uh, the problem had reversed. The Kaveri now the flow in the Kaveri was too large and uh, it started uh, <coughs> um, the the incidence of silt ag uh, aggrading instead the river started degrading and the slopes became uh, faster and there was a lot of erosion in the Kaveri and in the uh, delta region. So to fix that, in 1845, uh, <coughs> a dam was placed on the Kaveri um, just downstream of the Grand Anicut to uh, reduce the erosion in this branch. Then. In 1851, there was a further modification made. If you notice, there is a, uh, another branch called the Venar, which is uh, bifurcating about uh, <coughs> um, a few kilometers upstream of the uh, Grand Anicut. That this was shut, and the Venar was connected directly uh, across from the Grand Anicut. So the Venar uh, now started flowing from here. Okay. Then, in 1886, to further control the problem, there were regulators put on the Kaveri and Venar. And finally, in 1934, uh, another canal was uh, dug here for irrigation uh, south of the Venar called the Grand Anicut Canal. And around the same time, the Maitur Dam was also completed uh, upstream of the island of Sri Rangam. Okay. Now, the sources for all this uh, were painstakingly gathered by Chitra over a couple of years from the Tamil Nadu archives the India office in London and from a personal collection of a farmer. <coughs> okay, this is the present uh, uh, structure at the Grand Anicut. It is called the Grand Anicut uh, complex. This is taken from a paper in 1990. So, this is the original uh, location of the Grand Anicut and now you, ha you have the regulators on the uh, Kaveri and the Venar and then you have the Grand Anicut canal here and so on. Of course, the uh, situation at the start of uh, this whole system at the uh, upstream end of the island of Srirangam, Srirangam has changed uh, after the construction of the Metur Dam. So, really the flows uh, and the distributions in the Collidum and Kaveri have changed significantly because of that. <coughs> and uh, therefore, uh, part of these structures are uh, meant to handle the, the uh, changed uh, flow patterns after the Metur Dam. But uh, really, it appears that you have a very complex system now to do the function of uh, a simple side weir. Now, we have done some amount of um, experiments and some amount of analysis to understand uh, why how the original uh, uh, system could have worked. Now, to, to, uh, to understand a little bit of the details, one needs to look at uh, what happens and, uh, at when a canal takes off from a uh, main river. Now, <coughs> 
this is uh, um, um, uh, a figure of a river with a canal on one side. You can see the main flow goes up while the canal flow is uh, diverted. Usually, this angle is about uh, 30 degrees or so in uh, the modern systems. Okay. Uh, <coughs> you can see that uh, the flow entering the canal has to actually take a curve. Now, when the uh, water goes through a curve, uh, it sets up a secondary flow. The reason is the um, when the flow goes through a curve, uh, depending on which frame of which frame of reference you are, there's either a centrifugal force or a centripetal force necessary to maintain the curve, and therefore the pressure on the uh, convex side is higher than the pressure uh, at the concave side. Okay, this is what gives us the centripetal force required for the turning of the streamlines. Now, the pressure gradient is set by the flow at the surface, which is the highest moving flow. But when you go to the bed, the flow is much slower. And uh, at the bed, this pressure gradient that is set up by the upper faster moving flow is too high. And this causes a uh, transverse flow near the bed going from the convex uh, surface to the concave surface of the flow. Okay. So, you get a transverse flow and uh, to uh, for continuity, you must have a transverse flow on the upper surface uh, going from the uh, uh, smaller radius to the out, uh, larger radius. Okay. So, this is the typical secondary flow that is set up and this flow is crucial to, to understand how the sediment which is at the bottom of the uh, river uh, moves. So, there is a transverse flow and the sediment will therefore, <coughs> uh, accumulate uh, on the concave uh, surface and uh, get eroded from the convex part or if you look at the, uh, the canal itself sediment will accumulate at the uh, upstream end of the canal and get eroded from the downstream end of the canal. Okay. Now, to, in order to, uh, uh, to control this, uh, there were a series of experiments done by Lilyavsky in the 1950s and uh, he found that if he put a submerged uh, sand screen uh, <coughs> with a slope that is opposite to the expected bed slope. You know, as, I, as we said, if the flow is this way, then the bed would be higher on the upstream uh, end and uh, lower on the downstream end. So, he put a sand screen which has a slope opposite to this and he had uh, estimated uh, based on the uh, velocity and the other geometry what the slope should be to be effective and he found that he was uh, the silt load in the canal uh, was reduced considerably and this is uh, very important because one of the main problems with the uh, canal system is the periodic maintenance required at the uh, mouth of the at the start of the canal where uh, the it get tends to get choked due to silting. Okay. Now, if you look at the slope uh, of the Grand Anicut, it is exactly opposite to this. It is higher at the uh, upstream end and lower at the downstream end and uh, Chitra did a quick calculation and found that uh, uh, <coughs> the slope is almost exactly opposite to what is predicted by uh, Lelyaskiv's uh, uh, expression for uh, being an effective sand screen. So, this now uh, effectively uh, does the opposite job of sand screen that permits uh, sediment uh, flow from the main river into the site, which is what we require for the uh, Kaveri to be maintained. Now, I will come to the second problem that we looked at, which is the uh, uh, comparison of the traditional Anicut or uh, weir with the modern weir. And this is a comparison of how the arrangement is. In the uh, present day engineering cons uh, constructions, the uh, weir is perpendicular to the main river flow and then the uh, canal is offtake is uh, slightly upstream of the weir and at an angle to the main river usually about 30 degrees or so. In the traditional uh, system, the weir was um, more or less L shaped. Uh, in some cases, it is a U shape when there were uh, two canals on either side, but in usually if you take a single uh, canal, it is L shaped and the canal uh, initially flows almost parallel to the river and then uh, bifurcates. <coughs> now, as we had said, uh, the problem with the uh, modern arrangement is that uh, over time, uh, the uh, entry to the canal gets choked up because of uh, this excessive silt carried into the canal and because of the, uh, the way it accumulates at the um, uh, start of the canal. <coughs> now, there are several uh, ways of uh, handling uh, the uh, this problem and excluding uh, sediment from entering the canal. Uh, if the river has a natural bend, then if you place the canal at the uh, tip of the bend, 
then uh, there is a natural secondary flow already present in the river which forces the sediment into the main flow rather than into the canal. Of course, one may not always uh, be fortunate to have uh, such a system. Uh, <coughs> the other uh, uh, the ways of handling this are by putting submerged uh, veins. Uh, by if we are fortunate enough to have an island like structure in the, in the uh, middle of the river, then that also creates secondary flows which are advantages or by uh, using sand screen as uh, Liliaski uh, demonstrated. Now, what we would like to show is that uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, traditional um, uh, arrangement uh, performs just as well uh, as uh, these without any of the extra structures that are required for uh, excluding sediment. Of course, the uh, initial cost of the uh, traditional structure is uh, uh, higher because the total uh, length of the construction is nearly uh, three times the width of the river while the modern weir is uh, approximately the is, is the width of the river itself. Okay. Okay. Now, these uh, this study uh, to compare the uh, to the uh, functioning of the modern weir and the traditional anicut uh, was done experimentally and uh, this is the uh, rough arrangement. <coughs> Uh, I will not go in through go into the um, uh, uh, details of uh, how the uh, scaling was done and so on. Uh, all I will mention is that uh, effectively we are simulating about uh, um, <coughs> uh, 800 uh, meters of the river flow and uh, the river that we are um, uh, Okay, I will now describe the uh, way we investigated the uh, difference between the traditional uh, <coughs> anicut arrangement and the modern weir. It was uh, done by simulating the flow in an, uh, an experimental setup. Um, <coughs> the specific uh, plan form was taken from an existing uh, for the uh, traditional uh, anicut was taken from uh, an existing anicut on the Tamparaparani uh, river and we are effectively simulating about uh, 800 meters of uh, along the length of the river. <coughs> so, the uh, scale in the along the uh, flow direction is about uh, 1 in 200. <coughs> uh, the same scale is uh, maintained for the uh, uh, in the transverse direction the river is about uh, 200 meters wide and uh, but uh, <coughs> as um, uh, um, I mean, uh, but to permit some measurement, the vertical scale, and in this uh, picture, uh, since it's a plan view, it's the, what's coming out of the paper. The vertical scale uh, in the experiment was about uh, uh, two to three times larger than what the scaling would show. Now, in uh, <coughs> in uh, simulating uh, river flows on a laboratory scale, there are several. Uh, uh, factors we need to keep in uh, uh, keep in mind. Uh, there are several uh, non-dimensional numbers that we would like to match. And the three principal ones would be the fruit number and uh, non-dimensional uh, roughness <coughs> parameter and uh, the uh, Reynolds number. Now, it is very difficult to match all three and uh, people have shown that it is uh, not essential to match all three. The Reynolds number needs to be high enough in the laboratory to ensure turbulent flow, but beyond that it does not uh, play too much of a role in uh, the details of the flow. Uh, the most important parameter is the uh, bed roughness and this is what we uh, try to match. Um, Chitra did a very serious uh, detailed exercise on uh, how to decide the flow rates and the uh, scaling to so that the model is not uh, too distorted, but a certain amount of distortion is uh, has to be uh, accepted. Uh, but the other uh, reason we were not uh, overly bothered by it uh, was that what we are interested in is, uh, is in a qualitative uh, study between the patterns uh, seen for the uh, modern beer and the uh, <coughs> uh, traditional anicut. Now, uh, in the actual experimentation, the, the beer uh, uh, structure was placed here to simulate the modern beer and, uh, <coughs> and the flow was taken to the canal. For studying the uh, traditional system, this was closed and uh, 
the uh, traditional uh, beer was placed in the uh, main flow and the canal was taken from the side here. Now the uh, entire system was fitted with two outlet tanks so we could keep track of the flow through the canal side and uh, in the main flow. There was also an arrangement um, when we did uh, experiments with the uh, moving bed to uh, collect the silt output at this end and this end and uh, keep track of it separately. Okay. And then the flows were then eventually sent to pump, sump and pump back to the uh, start of the uh, tank. Okay. Now the experiments were uh, as I said <coughs> uh, had two parts to compare the uh, shapes of the modern and traditional uh, system and also uh, to investigate the effect of slots that are usually present on the traditional wear. The slots may be at two or, two or three locations on the platform. Okay. Uh, quickly to go through the uh, <coughs> how the experiments are conducted, uh, quite a lot of it was uh, flow visualization and uh, <coughs> uh, we used uh, a rake with uh, two sets of inks, uh, potassium permanganate uh, solution was uh, used to obtain the flow near the upper surface of the flow and uh, green ink was used to visualize the flow near the bed of the uh, <coughs> flow. Okay. The, uh, the depth of flow was measured by uh, having a scale mounted on uh, rails here and uh, having a pointer that would touch the top surface of the flow. Okay. Uh, for low speed measurements, uh, we used a wire mesh which was placed on top of the uh, tank. Uh, above the flow and uh, video camera to allow us to see the uh, <coughs> to estimate flow speeds and for high speed uh, measurements greater than 25 centimeters a second a two hole offset probe was used to measure the velocity. Now for uh, two sets of experiments are done one with a fixed bed and the other one with uh, a mobile bed and for the mobile bed we need a, a sand feed system to uh, continuously feed uh, sand or uh, silt at the uh, upstream end of the uh, tank and uh, allow it to uh, be carried by the flow and uh, make its own bed form. So the sand feed mechanism consisted, we tried several uh, things and we were most successful with a conveyor belt uh, on which uh, sand was laid and a scraper to maintain a <coughs> certain um, height of uh, sand on the conveyor uh, belt and this allowed us to give a fairly controlled input of about 5 kg per hour. Uh, for the sand. Okay. So, this is the uh, <coughs> as I said the uh, traditional anicut is taken from uh, the, uh, an existing anicut on the Tambra Parni river and the scale is about uh, 200. Okay. Now, these are the uh, flow visualization pictures uh, showing the flow that uh, occurs for the uh, modern weir. So, you can see the weir uh, submerged under the flow at this uh, <coughs> uh, uh, location and then the canal is uh, here and uh, you can see that the dividing streamline uh, which divides the uh, flow entering the canal from the flow going into the main uh, river stream is somewhere around here okay. and uh, because of the pink lines which are uh, demonstrating the upper surface flow all uh, go over the weir uh, up to this point. This pink line uh, or purple line enters the uh, canal which is shown here. However, if you look at the green lines right from this region they seem to shift and uh, towards the canal and uh, some of this green ink does enter the canal. So, the silt load is uh, that is entering the canal comes from a much wider region than the flow and this is what leads to the uh, choking of the canal. The uh, <coughs> traditional anish cut shape is uh, as shown here and um, here if you look at the uh, surface and um, <coughs> bed flows you see that uh, the dividing seam line is uh, somewhere here as uh, um, was present for the uh, <coughs> uh, modern canal but you see the deviation between the upper and lower lines is very small. So, the uh, silt load is more or less coming from the uh, part of the flow that is going into the canal and uh, the <coughs> flow that goes over the uh, weir into the main flow carries most of its silt with it. Okay. Uh, if you look at the um, actual flow that is diverted into the canal 
then a very interesting picture emerges. Um, <coughs> for low flow rates, the uh, traditional anicut diverted more of the flow into the canal uh, than the modern anicut. On the other hand, for very high flow rates, uh, the flow in the modern anicut, uh, the diversion of the flow is higher. Now, this has uh, very interesting implications. It means that when the flow in the main river is low, then uh, more water is available in the canal for irrigation. Uh, at the same time, with the traditional anicut, during floods, the water diverted in the canal is uh, lower and therefore, the uh, irrigated region is better protected during a flood. Now, the, uh, this is in terms of the uh, <coughs> uh, actual flow entering the canal and uh, uh, corresponding measurement of the flow velocity indicated that the picture was even better uh, in the case of the traditional anicut. Just notice here when the flow enters the canal with the uh, traditional anicut, there is a convergence of uh, streamlines and the velocity in the canal region is maintained very high and therefore, the water surface level both uh, over the weir and uh, at the entry to the canal is much higher than what would you would get with the uh, modern anicut system. And if the water uh, velocity is higher, then the water levels would be lower. This again is very useful during a flood, because the, then the um, extent of uh, lateral spread of the river is much lower and uh, that again pr uh, protects the irrigated uh, land. Okay. Uh, <coughs> In the mobile bed experiment, as I said, we had a sand feed mechanism and uh, fine silica was used okay. and uh, uh, three different cases are done, one with just a plain uh, <coughs> tank, the other one with the modern weir arrangement, the other one and the third with the uh, traditional uh, anicut arrangement. Uh, the first one was necessary to uh, determine what the equilibrium uh, dune size uh, would be for the flow rate uh, that we were maintaining in the flow. For all three experiments, the flow rate was maintained around uh, 9 liters per second and the uh, sediment uh, input was about uh, 5 kg per hour. Okay. Now, this experiment indicated that uh, the dune height was about uh, 5 to 6 centimeters and the, uh, and the uh, wavelength was about 20 centimeters and that uh, allowed us to design the uh, height or set the height of the uh, uh, weirs modern wear and the traditional anicut. And so, in this case, in this uh, set of uh, experiments, uh, these are about uh, 9 centimeters uh, high and uh, while they were much lower for the fixed bed experiment. Okay. Now, just to quickly uh, give an overview of uh, what the main results are. <coughs> with the modern wear, about uh, 26 percent uh, with the mobile, in the mobile bed experiment, 26 percent of the flow was diverted into the canal. But 80 percent of the silt went into the canal, which is very, very high. Uh, with the traditional uh, anicut, about 18 percent of the flow went into the canal, but only 15, 50 percent of the uh, silt entered the canal. Um, <coughs> but uh, this, uh, uh, if you look at the ratios, the, the relatively the silt load entering the uh, canal with the modern uh, weir is uh, higher. But uh, more importantly, it is the patterns that emerge at the uh, entry to the canal. Now, uh, <coughs> it mean if you notice here, uh, at for the uh, modern weir, there is a scour region here and then there is a pile up of uh, sediment at the other end as expected and also further downstream. This scour region uh, deposits sediment all around and more or less the entry to the canal, uh, there is a large uh, across the entire uh, width of the uh, canal entry, there is a large deposit of sediment. On the other hand, with the um, traditional uh, anicut, the entire uh, entry to the canal is uh, kept free of sediment. In fact, there is it appears to be slightly eroded there. So, this area is kept completely uh, free of sediment and the flow in the canal is not uh, compromised. Okay. This is a more detailed view of the same thing showing the secondary flow. Uh, when you have um, flow uh, approaching a pyre, uh, vortex is set up at the base which causes the scouring and that is very clearly seen in uh, the uh, uh, sand dune pictures. Okay, this uh, <coughs> shows the uh, measurements of the water surface level. Um, <coughs> uh, 
uh, what is shown is uh, the, the level below the uh, benchmark level, but uh, finally in this picture uh, <coughs> um, it is clear that the water surface is about uh, 4 to 5 millimeters higher for the modern anicut uh, for the modern weir as opposed to the traditional anicut and the velocities are correspondingly higher for the uh, traditional anicut. So, in summary the water levels are higher for the modern uh, weir and lower for the traditional anicut. The water surface velocity is lower for the uh, modern uh, weir and higher in the uh, traditional anicut. The transverse bed, bed gradient at the uh, start of the canal is quite perceptible for the uh, modern weir, but does not exist in the uh, <coughs> traditional anicut and there is a scour region at the downstream end for the modern weir, but right across preventing uh, choking of the canal for the traditional anicut. So, in conclusion uh, the analysis of the problem that uh, problem we looked at and the experiments uh, indicate that the traditional anicuts were designed uh, to both provide flow at the same time control the sediment problem. The um, <coughs> traditional, traditional anicut shape uh, allowed for higher uh, flow velocities, lower uh, uh, flow levels at the same time reduced sediment entry into the canals and uh, when we looked at the Grand Anicut, the, its shape was designed to uh, increase the sediment transfer during uh, a flood situation from the main uh, river into the distributary. Okay. So, all in all it appears that uh, they were uh, uh, <coughs> well optimized designs to from both flow rate and uh, sediment control point of view. So, I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much and I would uh, I guess ask uh, Kaumedi to handle the discussion section if there is any. Okay, thank you very much. Then.